I'm Jim Walsh at the MIT Security Studies Program, and I'm here to tell you about Siegfried Pecker. He is Professor of Research in the Department of Management, Science, and Engineering at Stanford University, but of course that does not begin to capture the significance of a career devoted to the national security of the United States of America, if I may say so, to global peace and security. Professor Hecker served as the fifth director of the Los Alamos National Laboratory, one of three nuclear weapons labs, from 1986 to 1997, a position of awesome responsibility. He is the winner of the Seaborg Medal and the Enrico Fermi Award. More importantly, he is a man of both science and values a reasoned voice in a time of ideology and conspiracies. This immigrant came to America and has worked to make us safer and more secure. I am proud to have him as a colleague and prouder still to be able to call him a friend. Will you please join me in welcoming Professor Hecker. Well, thank you, Jim. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here to uh, talk a bit uh, about this topic of scientific diplomacy, scientific nuclear diplomacy. Uh, and uh, in talking with Jim beforehand, we thought it might be interesting to sort of go around the nuclear hotspots uh, of the world, because to a large extent, uh, that's what uh, this seminar is doing. And so it's a particular pleasure for me to address people from the executive branch and from congressional branch uh, and give you uh, at least my view uh, of what scientists can do uh, in the area of diplomacy. Uh, just as a bit of background, uh, Jim pointed out I was at Los Alamos. I, I actually got to Los Alamos a bit more than 50 years ago. Uh, 1965 as a summer student. Uh, and um, for the first 25 years, even though I went away and got a PhD in, uh, and worked at General Motors for a while, for the first 25 years, uh, what I did mostly to help provide the technical aspects of this country's nuclear deterrent, and of course that was primarily aimed at the Soviet Union. And, and so the idea was how to make sure uh, that the nuclear weapons in the hands of the Soviet government did not do harm to us or to our allies. And then the world flipped upside down with the dissolution or the breakup of the Soviet Union. So I've now spent the last 25 years trying to make sure that the nuclear weapons actually are sufficiently secure in the hands of the Russian government and its successors so that somebody doesn't do harm to the United States, to our allies, and for that matter, uh, to the entire world. So that's sort of how my career has been split. Much of that was done while I was still uh, director at Los Alamos, because the Soviet Union came apart essentially right at the beginning of my directorship. Uh, but then in 2005, after 40 years off and on Los Alamos, I went to Stanford, uh, where quite frankly, uh, the most important thing I do uh, is to teach uh, and to teach students. And particularly, I have a class uh, that was started by uh, none other than Bill Perry, former Secretary of Defense, uh, and that I've taken over. And uh, we teach about 250 students a year uh, on issues of technology and national security. Uh, and I think that's actually one of the most important uh, contributions uh, that I can make. But so even though much of my work has been focused uh, on, on uh, Russia, the Soviet Union. Uh, I've also you know, had occasion to sort of tackle these other hot spots around the world. And so that's what I thought I, I would talk about uh, today, and, and particularly in keeping uh, with this afternoon where you had this fascinating discussion on North Korea. I'm going to start with North Korea. Uh, and I'm going to give you sort of the inside scoop uh, of North Korea, because as uh, Jim had mentioned, you know, for better or worse, as he mentioned at the seminar, uh, I've been in North Korea, and I've actually been in North Korea seven times. Now you wonder, what in the world am I doing here 
uh, although in home territory, because it looked a lot like TA-55, the plutonium facility at Los Alamos. So I, I was no way uh, out of my element. Uh, but, so I did get there. So what do scientists have to be able to contribute to the current, particularly uh, the current drama that's playing out? And so my view is what the scientists have to help to do is to answer these very important questions. And actually, if you look at all the news coverage today, there's very little coverage of these questions. What do they actually have? You know, how did they get it? It matters. You know, when did they get it? That also really matters. And then why? And so that's what I'm going to give you just very brief. And since I'm going to walk you around the world, I'm going to have to give you uh, just a, a, a quick, oops. Uh, so, so that's what we're going to do. So in, in North Korea, then, to give you some details, so for reasons that I would have never believed would ever happen, I wind up in North Korea in January of 2004. It was my colleague John Lewis from Stanford who'd been doing track two diplomacy with the North Koreans. He did it before with the Chinese. And so as you can see on the upper left here in this picture, uh, I'm there essentially in the middle. Uh, John Lewis is there with the writing pad. And we're overlooking the spent fuel pool uh, in North Korea, because the question was, the uh, spent fuel, which was unloaded in 1994 as part of the agreed framework, had been held in a spent fuel pool for more than eight years as part of the agreed framework. But then, when the Bush administration confronted the North Koreans in October 2002, in 2003, North Koreans walked away from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, and said they're going to build a bomb. Uh, but the whole year went by, and nobody seemed to care. You didn't have the sort of fuss we're having right now. As you also remember, 2003, our country was occupied someplace else in the world uh, called the Iraq. So I think the North Koreans were so upset, they said, look, we went ahead, we processed this fuel routes, we got the plutonium, we built the bomb, and nobody cares. <laughs> so I wound up in North Korea, you know, trying to essentially attest the fact that, yeah, these guys took the spent fuel rods out. They took me to their reprocessing facility. And having grown up in the nuclear world, you know, I knew what questions to ask him about the Purex process, how you separate plutonium from the rest of the spent fuel. They knew everything. And then I was still very skeptical because uh, I didn't want to be used by the North Koreans for propaganda. So I was still very skeptical. And when they finally said, we're sitting in a conference room, so, do you want to see our product? And I said, you mean the plutonium? And they said, yes. I said, sure, you know, I've seen a lot of plutonium. <laughs> so I actually wound up, believe it or not, I held their plutonium in my hand in a glass jar. It was a marmalade jar. <laughs> you know, it had a screw on top, and it had tape around it. So, you know, knowing something about plutonium, I knew it wasn't going to get out and do me any harm. Not my colleagues, like John Lewis and company, they were a little bit worried about this plutonium in the room. But, but nevertheless, so in, in that visit, uh, both the fact that I had the discussions with them about plutonium metallurgy. It turns out plutonium is the most complex element in the periodic table. It's almost impossible to make anything with it unless you figure out sort of the rules of the trade uh, of, of, uh, of how you do plutonium metallurgy. They knew all of that. They showed me a shape, which is a thin-walled uh, uh, funnel. And I came back and I said, if they can make that little piece, 150 grams, they can make a bomb. Uh, and so we learned a lot. So through that visit, we got stuff that you can never get, essentially, any other way. In 2006, it, it turns out, they tested in October. I was there, as you can see in the middle, with the director of the Yangbin nuclear complex, uh, Li Hang Sa. Uh, and we talked about the test. Uh, and uh, you know, I said, well, it didn't seem to work so well. And they said, well, you know, Dr. Hecker, it's much harder to make a small bomb than a big bomb. I said, well, it's also easier to get a small yield when a big one doesn't work. <laughs> it turns out the North Koreans actually had an incredible sense of humor. Uh, so, <laughs> So we learned a lot as to what their involvement was in the plutonium facility, what happened. 
And we're back again in 2007, which is the first time, and still the, the only time, any Westerner has ever been in their plutonium glove box facilities. Uh, others, it turns out, the inspectors, you know, during uh, 1994 and 2002 had lots of access to the reactor, reprocessing. We know a lot uh, about the plutonium facility, but nobody had ever seen the glove box in their operations. Again, when you do that, you learn things that are important. Uh, and that was a time when the North Koreans were actually uh, in a diplomatic mode. They were behaving, as, as we like to say, and they were disabling uh, as part of a, of a Bush, uh, George W. Bush, and also Chris Hill, uh, who was the ambassador of Six Party Talks. And then the same in 2008, when they actually showed me they'd taken the lathes out of the facility where they were machining the uranium, and they had moved them out. So uh, there were six uh, altogether every year from 2004. And, and then the seventh one uh, was really mind-boggling. So what happened there that, lo and behold, they had denied that they have centrifuge uh, capabilities and, and do enriched uranium. And then they took me through this facility, which only two years earlier I had been in. And it was the uranium metal fabrication facility. They completely gutted that facility moved in these 2,000 ultra-modern centrifuges, ultra-modern flat panel displays, LEDs. It was just amazing. I told them before, I said, I know you guys are doing enrichment. I know you have centrifuges. What I didn't know is what they actually wound up having, so 2,000 centrifuges. But let me just stop here to tell you, the only outsiders that have ever seen the centrifuge facility were my Stanford colleagues, John Lewis, Bob Carlin, and myself. Nobody else has seen them. Nobody else knows anything about this firsthand and direct. So I'll come back to this later. Our estimates of highly enriched uranium, people can tell you they have 20 to 25 bombs. This is highly uncertain. Because for those of you who know this lingo, uh, I had concluded they were what are called P2s, so the Pakistani P2 with margin steel rotors. Uh, so they can make a, a lot of highly enriched uranium. If they were P1s instead, and you can't tell from the outside of these, because the outside is all just an aluminum jacket. Uh, if they were P1s, you're immediately off by a factor of four. Uh, so in the end, th there has to be sort of a dab of humility uh, in anything that we estimate about North Korean uh, capabilities. But it was mind-blowing. Again, we look back now and say, why would they show me this? Well, you know, I don't know. I mean, they didn't really tell me, uh, except I more or less have to conclude is they were telling the United States, look, we not only have the plutonium route to the bomb, which is very limited with that little reactor that they have that they got started in 1986, but we also have the uranium path to the bomb, and you'll never know how much we have because we hit this thing. It even had this blue metal roof on it that they put a new roof on, and we didn't know inside of that were centrifuges. And it's not because our intel is bad, it's just because it's hard to tell centrifuges. So that was the, the warning. So we put our estimates on the basis of that, but then they give us a little help. And that is the young leader uh, walks around and does on-the-spot guidance, and lo and behold, he shows up here, and they publish this uh, on K in KCNA, a Korea Central News Agency. And so they show this. This thing is a flow-forming machine with which you actually make the margining steel rotors. Uh, and we also have some ideas that they came from Spain. So there's a little bit about the trade that actually happens uh, in uh, the export uh, arena. So we had a little help from them. Uh, then we also had this help, which is totally amazing. Uh, you know, some of the analysts have called this the disco ball. Uh, but this is what they claim was their miniaturized warhead, uh, which is it's about 60 centimeters if you compare it uh, to the size uh, of Kim Jong-un, for example. Uh, <laughs> so, and 60 centimeters would be pretty threatening. Uh, that fits on a number uh, of the North Korean uh, short and medium range missiles. And then they actually showed the missiles in the past. Now before, when they launched things, they always said, these are peaceful rocket launchers. Well, that's gone away. They don't make that pretense anymore. They show you the missiles, and they say, uh, you know, here we are, and we have a miniaturized uh, warhead. Uh, then they actually showed you this. This is a frame grab 
uh, from one of the videos where they showed how this disco ball would be mounted inside of a reentry vehicle. So we don't know exactly. Uh, there are some things that related to that shape that are sort of strange. Uh, it's not exactly, let's say, the way that we might design it. Uh, however, uh, you essentially have to assume uh, on the basis of the nuclear tests, where they've had five over 10 years, uh, and particularly the last three have been sort of close uh, to Hiroshima and Nagasaki destructive size. Uh, by the way, that's good enough. I mean, they don't have to have a hydrogen bomb. Uh, the only real reason for the hydrogen bomb is just try to make it smaller, and yes, indeed, even more threatening. Uh, but 13 to 20 kilotons or so uh, will be good enough. Uh, so, oops, I went backwards. So then let, let me just sort of briefly then summarize as best as we can put it. So what do they have? Uh, again, with the proviso that we're not sure, uh, maybe 20 to 40 kilograms of plutonium. That's a pretty good estimate because we've got that covered from all angles, maybe four to eight bombs worth. And they can only make at most one bombs worth a year. They're not operating the reactor consistently, so it's less than that. Highly enriched uranium, as I told you, we just don't know. Uh, I put what I learned together with a lot of circumstantial evidence that is from that you get from overhead, commercial uh, overhead. Uh, and I say it may, they may have 20 to 450 uh, kilograms. Gary Seymour today said, you know, we have large error bars, and, and indeed we have large error bars. Uh, so together, that may give them enough nuclear materials, fissile materials, bomb fuel, for 20 to 25 nuclear weapons. We don't know that for sure. They probably haven't actually built 25 nuclear weapons, but they have the bomb fuel. And the bomb fuel and the making of the bomb fuel is the limiting thing to the size of the arsenal. So we, at least, we have to assume they may have you know, up to a couple of dozens worth uh, of nuclear material. So what can they make with that? Well, we know even less about weaponization because none of the guys that ever talked to me said they were part of the design team. They just said, we produce the plutonium, then later the highly enriched uranium, and we give it away. It's done someplace else. We don't know. However, the one thing we know there is the bottom line is these five nuclear tests. And quite frankly, five nuclear tests over a 10-year time period, you learn an enormous amount. And these guys are good. By the way, all aspects that I'll mention later when I talk about how these guys are technically very good. So uh, we have to assume they certainly, they know how to make Hiroshima and Nagasaki like bomb and probably make them small enough uh, to reach South Korea and Japan. Uh, to get to an intercontinental size missile, that's much more difficult. You've got to go smaller yet, and it has lots of other stresses, thermal you know, problems, and it's just difficult. So they'd have to test some more. The sophistication of the weapon is governed by the nuclear testing. Okay. Then the delivery, of course, is the missile business. And, and there I was surprised for quite a while that, that they actually didn't shoot more missiles off. You know, in 2012, 13, 14, I said, why aren't they doing more missile tests? I think they were building their missile. They were parading things in Pyongyang. Well, so they fixed the problem in 2016 and this year. You know, they shot off some 30 shots. Now, it turns out only about uh, some people claim about 16 of those were successful, so some of those fail. And they're trying to move to solid fuel, which is more threatening because uh, they're essentially sitting there ready instead of having to, to load uh, the liquid propellant. So, and then of course they've gone to the road mobile, that's what you can do with solid, they've gone to submarine launched. Uh, but that program is still sort of clipping along. I'm not concerned that they can reach the United States today. That's going to take, we don't know for sure, you know, you know, maybe five more years with solid rockets, maybe even longer uh, than that. Uh, so, uh, the, the how part, uh, let me just I'll say that very, very quickly. Uh, they had initial help from the Soviets for Atoms for Peace program, just like we helped the Iranians. You know, we built the first reactor in Iran, the uh, reactor in Iran, the Soviets built the first reactor in North Korea, but they told them, don't you dare build bombs. They didn't initially, but they learned uh, a lot. Uh, and then uh, they used uh, uh, what I would call sort of a leaky international control system, uh, export control system. You know, greedy businessmen in Europe, uh, even things from Japan, Russia, from all over, they managed to get the materials that they needed 
to augment the knowledge and capabilities that they had. And then they had an assist on the centrifuges from AQ Khan. Uh, not only getting sort of a couple of dozens as a starter kit, but more importantly, having the technicians trained at the AQ Khan uh, research laboratories. And so they had help. But then after that, all stopped in 2004. And they've built those centrifuges since that time. They've done that themselves. And it's really quite remarkable. So you, you have to make sure that you respect their technical tape. They built the reactor themselves. They built the reprocessing facility they saw themselves. Now they've built the centrifuge facilities. When did they do it? It turns out that's also very important. It's been going on for 50 some years. That first research reactor went in, I think it was like 1967, built by the Soviets. So they essentially were putting in place a lot what Iran did for many years. So the building the capabilities uh, to have the option for the bomb. And then they finally pulled the plug on that uh, after the Bush confrontation in October 2002, and they went ahead and, and built the bomb. So, but then, uh, and so the, the, the first real red line was crossed during the Bush administration. And I think most of you know, there were people in the Bush administration who absolutely were determined to kill that agreed framework. They killed that agreed framework. They were not prepared for the consequences. I think that's one lesson we need to look at for Iran. If you're gonna kill somebody, kill something, you better be prepared for the consequences. They were not prepared for the consequences, North Koreans withdrew from the non-profession duty, built the bomb, tested the bomb. By the end of the Bush administration, they may have had sort of a handful of crude nuclear weapons. Then came the Obama administration, and it tried some diplomacy, but in the end, never sufficiently in depth that they made any progress. And what happened during the Obama administration, they went from a handful of bombs to a nuclear arsenal and one that uh, they then had tested uh, essentially five times. So that's then when that capability on the North Korean side just went up significantly. So that's the when. Why, uh, of course, uh, my colleague Scott Sagan wrote a paper, but many other people thought it very similar. Security, and in this case, security of the regime. But then interestingly, uh, the way things changed, uh, once they actually built the bomb. Once they tested, then prestige became, international prestige became a big factor. I mean, if you think they're one of less than 10 countries that have a nuclear weapon, I mean, their economy is somewhere in the hundred something, but in nuclear weapons, they're one of less than 10. And then domestic issues, really interesting. Uh, domestically, before 2005, nuclear weapons were never mentioned. Now they're mentioned all the time, and in essence, you know, we, the regime, is protecting you from these bad Americans. And that's why you have to continue to sacrifice and to suffer. So it now has all three of, of those aspects as to why. And then particularly, the point uh, that I want to make from the why is, is the, the what and the why are interrelated. If you don't have much, then the reason for having a nuclear weapon is just to sort of keep somebody on guard. Once you had a few bombs, like in the Bush administration, it's deterrence because you can't quite make sure they're not gonna uh, go ahead and detonate one, like a terrorist device, for example. But if you've got an arsenal of 20-some weapons, it's a whole different story. It might change the whole strategic thinking about the peninsula. And this is the place where I'm really concerned. And, and I must say, today's narrative that's out there in the news media doesn't quite capture what my biggest concerns are. So my biggest concerns are actually that a nuclear weapon will go off on the Korean Peninsula. And that will be a disaster. Uh, I'm not, at this point, I'm not saying the crisis is going to happen when they can reach the United States. The crisis is here now because a nuclear weapon going off in the Korean Peninsula will change the world the way that we know it. So how could a nuclear weapon go off? Are they gonna go ahead and launch a preemptive attack on South Korea? The answer is, I don't think so. I think Gary Seymour said today they might be homicidal, but they're not suicidal. So that's not gonna happen. Uh, on the other hand, 
You know, what about overconfidence? Now you're dealing with a young man. We're dealing with strategic rocket forces that never had these things before. So what about the overconfidence? What about miscalculations? What about the fact that they may now actually, particularly with the turmoil uh, and chaos in the South, uh, they can actually think about using those weapons for either diplomatic or military coercion? Or even the thought of sort of de-escalating if they're going to be losing a conventional war. You fire off one of these nuclear weapons, it's, it's going to keep the Americans down. What about accidents? You know, the five tests may have allowed them to miniaturize the device some, but it doesn't necessarily have taught them how to make them safe. You know, we had a couple hundred tests by the time we still, at Los Alamos and Livermore, by the time we found out some things we didn't appreciate about nuclear weapon safety, something called, the Jim knows that and others, one point safety. Uh, the fact that if you hit a nuclear weapon at any given point, you actually get a mushroom cloud. Uh, we then went ahead and redesigned to make sure that you actually had to set off the detonators to make it implode properly. How much of that do, do they know? I've actually discussed that with one of their generals. I said, what about one point safety? I mean, he didn't have the faintest idea uh, of what I was talking about. So suppose one goes off by accident in North Korea. Do you think they're going to admit that it was theirs? You know, there's no way. It was the United States that nuked North Korea. And what will that set off? And then what about security? So people talk about regime change. And maybe this is actually one of the main reasons that Chinese don't want to do regime change. We all hear about the fact they don't want the United States south of the Yalu River. Uh, and they don't want uh, refugees coming across the Yalu River. What about if they've actually thought about, suppose there's a regime change from underneath, from whatever. Who gets to keep the nuclear weapons? What's the security of those nuclear weapons? That's the crisis that I say we have now. And so the what now, what I've been trying to promote, so today we heard arguments uh, in favor of negotiation. I'm all in favor of negotiation, but this is not the time. We're not ready for negotiation. I said President Trump should send a presidential envoy to North Korea not to negotiate, but to sort of have, actually, um, Gary Seymour used the term, a private red line. A private red line. Have a discussion to make sure that they understand we cannot take a risk of a nuclear explosion. We cannot take a risk uh, of, a, of, a, of a nuclear accident. And one has that discussion with them to sort of tamper down the whole rhetoric that we've had so far and make sure that at least for the near term, we don't have a nuclear explosion on the Korean Peninsula. And then from that basis on, perhaps you can then try to develop enough of a dialogue that you can get back to negotiations. But that's a longer term project. It's not denuclearization now. That's just not going to happen. We got to develop the conditions for that. Can they ever be developed? I'm not sure. I'm actually on the side that it may be possible. But that's not the issue. So what's the challenge for a good uh, a president? So you go back. Clinton, his challenge was don't let him build a bomb. In spite of all the flack that he takes, guess what? He succeeded. I don't think they build a bomb during the administration. And actually, the things that I hardly ever mentioned, there were two bigger reactors than the one that kept operating. They would have made 300 kilograms of plutonium a year if they had been finished. And they went defunct as a result of the agreed framework. They're dead. The only one left working was the little one that can make one less than one bomb's worth a year. That was a major, major deceleration uh, of their program. And it's not sufficient. Now, while he had this agreed framework, they cheated on the uranium enrichment. But that was something that was going to take another dozen years or so instead of, of that. OK, then comes George W. Bush. He said, we'll never let North Korea have nuclear weapons. Well, by the time he left office, they had a nuclear weapon. They not only had one, but they may have had uh, up to six nukes by the end of his time. So, uh, and at that time, still no successful uh, missile tests. Then President Obama comes in, totally different approach. Same result. Not only now, his job was make sure they don't build an arsenal. Don't go from a few primitive bombs to another. They built an arsenal. And so that failed. 
and then successful missile tests by the time they went out. Now, President Trump, some people will say his job is to denuclearize North Korea. No, right now his job is make sure we don't have a nuclear explosion on the Korean Peninsula. That's what he has to focus on. So that's, that, that's my pitch for what it's worth with North, for North Korea. Okay, so let, let me uh, move on uh, to the Soviet Union uh, and Russia, uh, because that's actually where I know a number of people in the room, uh, and, and I myself spent much, much more of my time. I already told you the whole threat change with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, uh, and what I show here, it was really brought into focus when Gorbachev essentially was put in the house arrest on the days of August 18 to 21 uh, under Crimea. They took away the nuclear suitcase, the controls for launching the nuclear weapons. That got everyone's attention. Uh, however, uh, uh, President Yeltsin stood on the T-72 tank. Uh, he managed to push that back and Gorbachev was allowed to come home, but it, it, was, it was the end uh, of the Soviet Union, the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union. And then really interesting uh, problems, of course, that we had was if you looked at, so what were the threats? It actually makes the North Korean threat sort of pale in comparison. So, loose nukes, tens of thousands, right? <laughs> Not four or six or maybe two, tens of thousands. Loose nuclear materials, not 20 to 40 kilograms of plutonium, a couple of hundred kilograms, 1.4 million kilograms of this stuff, as best as we can tell in the, so in the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union. Loose nuclear people, the uh, sort of brain train problem, a couple of hundred thousand. Altogether, there were a million people that worked uh, in the Soviet nuclear complex at the height. And then and loose exports. So he, here's a country where the whole political economic system comes apart and they have this stuff. How in the world do you now keep this safe and secure, keep the people there, the materials there, make sure the weapons don't get away? It, as I say, he had had the makings of a perfect storm. So how was that storm weathered? Well, a good part of it actually happened you know, right here in this area. Uh, Ash Carter, back in his early days, uh, and a number of his colleagues, including Steve Miller, who's here, uh, wrote the Soviet nuclear fission. And they laid out this nightmare scenario of what might be possible as the Soviet Union was coming apart. This, uh, and I show Ash Carter on the left, who was at Harvard at the time, of course, Department of Defense for a couple of stints and now back at Harvard. Bill Perry on the right, he was at Stanford at the time, Department of Defense, he's back at Stanford uh, now. So they, they were instrumental, that report was instrumental uh, and their presence was instrumental in convincing Senators Dunn and Lugar uh, to launch the cooperative threat reduction legislation. So that was instrumental. Then the scientists, and all of the ones I show you here except the upper right, that's Bill Potter, uh, he's a social scientist. Uh, the rest are all either physical or, or, or bioscientists. These people were essentially do essential during those times uh, of actually reaching across to the Soviet Union, I only show you Evgeny Velikov here, who is the Russian Academy of Sciences. I'm sure you recognize John Holden, Frank von Hippel from Princeton, David Hamburg. Uh, here's Bill Potter, Tom Neff, who played an essential role uh, in the megatons uh, to megawatts. Uh, Tom Cochran at the NRDC and Sid Drell, who unfortunately passed away a few months ago. Again, that NGO community was essentially and actually sort of thinking through the strategy that helped to underpin much of that legislation. But in addition, and that's the part I want to mention here tonight, because much less is known about that, and that is actually we, the weapons laboratories, as they're called, Los Alamos, Lawrence Livermore, and, and Sandia, we got into the act. So I first met my counterparts in 1988 in about a test site, what was called the Joint Verification Experiments. Uh, and then um, uh, after pushing very hard on the US government for a number of years, uh, I finally convinced them to allow me uh, and John Knuckles to go over uh, to the Soviet Union. We greeted Yuli Hariton, uh, who we call the Russian Oppenheimer, uh, in their Los Alamos, the city uh, of Sarov in 1992. And we built, and this is part of the science story, we built scientific cooperation. And that scientific cooperation then went from scientific cooperation to security operation. 
So there were actually times when we were there having workshops on how do you take nuclear weapons apart? You know, the safety concerns. I mean, the most dangerous part of the lifetime of a nuclear weapon, as long as it's not set off, is taking it apart. And aged nuclear weapons come back. It's rusted, it's changed. You gotta take it apart and make sure it doesn't blow up. Well, they had more weapons coming back than you could ever imagine. We had weapons coming back. We talked about how you do that. We talked about nuclear materials, and in fact, we talked about all of these things which were part. So the, the Nanluga program sort of provided the overall umbrella, and most importantly, they provided money, uh, because most of this stuff was paid for by American uh, money in conjunction uh, with the Russians. So we did everything from weapons to materials to workers to the infrastructure <laughs> to talking uh, already in 1992 about nuclear terrorism. Uh, the, the Russians always cared a lot about nuclear energy, and they even uh, cared and, and talked about their environmental problems. But then scientific research, and so during the 1990s, I'm just gonna give you a, a really short uh, version of this. The cooperation was just fantastic, uh, and we worked together. So then the bottom line uh, of all of that activity, so what happened to those four loose dangers? Loose nukes, there weren't any. Loose nuclear materials, very little. You know, those of you who've been in this business know 1993, 94, Frankfurt, Prague, a little bit of plutonium, some highly enriched uranium. But when you talk about 1.4 million kilograms, it was almost nothing. Uh, loose people, the brain drain, for the most part, very, very little. Probably not any worse than the United States, for that matter. Uh, and the exports, we had problems in the 1990s, a bit uh, their interactions with Iran but they've become a responsible nuclear exporting state, namely for nuclear energy, nuclear power. So that's the story that uh, we tell in this book, and I can advertise it because I don't get any of the proceeds. It was published by Los Alamos Historical Society, but two volumes, a thousand pages, 30 some articles from each side, from the Russian, from the American side, and we describe what we actually did together, why we did it, uh, and what we accomplished. And I won't describe the details because that's another talk, but let me just mention one of the things. Since I told you North Korea 20 to 40 kilograms of plutonium, as part of this activity, I wound up going to Kazakhstan because they had their test site in Kazakhstan. And so when I asked my Russian counterpart uh, from their Los Alamos, I said, did you guys leave something behind in Kazakhstan that you might be worried about? And he said, we're not going back because he was worried about the environmental issues. And I said, no, no, I know the environment, you know, may, may be bad problems. I'm talking about plutonium, highly enriched uranium. Did you leave anything behind that we should be concerned about? And he said, we're not going back. So I went. <laughs> I went with my Kaz uh, Kazakhs friends who we worked through the, the ISTC, if any State Department people were here, great program, International Science and Technology Center. They fu funded uh, the Kazakhs. They came to see me in Los Alamos. I went to the test site. This is the guard gate, okay, the test site. And then uh, my Kazakh friend told me, you know, the problem we have is we've got these guys pulling the copper cables out of the ground and selling them to the Chinese. I said, what's at the end of the copper cables? He said, we have no idea. The Russians don't tell us anything. I was expecting to find people on camelback, you know, pulling on those copper cables. Instead, this is what I found. I mean, a couple of hundred kilometers of these trenches dug with machinery, and the question is, what was at the other end? Well, at the end of summer, it was plutonium. Turns out they never got there. So we work with the Russians and the Kazakhs, and this is scientific cooperation. We work with the Kazakh scientists, work with the Russian scientists and the American scientists. Only the Russians knew what they did were. Only the Americans were able to assess the proliferation danger to decide whether we should fund it or not. And only the Kazakhs could actually remediate the problem because it's their country. So for example, here was a field that was full of plutonium samples down in the ground where they were doing explosive experiments. You know, the Russians love to blow things up. I mean, they just, <laughs> they use explosives for everything you can imagine. We did these things in glove boxes. They did them in the ground, you know, in, um, in Semipolitinsk. So we remediated that problem. Bottom line is that there, you know, on the order of at least 100 or so kilograms that was lying around 
Some of it's partially buried in Kazakhstan with the sort of security that I just showed you. So much more plutonium than North Korea has ever made. It was right there in Central Asia with very little policing. 15 years we worked together, uh, all in secret until our presidents announced it. OK, so that we did lots of things of that nature. I'll come back just to talk a little bit more about the science. But now I'm going to rush through these other things very quickly, uh, quickly because I know uh, the uh, night is late and, and you may have questions. So China. I went to China in 1994 for the first time, two years later than uh, uh, with the Russians, with the same, same concern. If China starts to open up, become more democratic, you know, that Russian system, by, by the way, the Soviet system of nuclear materials control was better than ours. They, you know, best we can tell, they never lost anything. They had what we call guns, guards, and gulags. You know, that's what protected them. And in that police state, it worked. And so I was afraid to the Chinese that they learn from the, from the Soviets. Well, they did, but it turns out they didn't come apart. Uh, and now over the last, this is 23 years, the Chinese have systematically greatly improved their nuclear security and safeguards program. Uh, and I've worked with them. We had a little interregnum of five years as a result of the Cox report and the so-called One Holy Affair, uh, when all communications were shut off between China uh, and ourselves, particularly between the weapons labs. But we work extremely effectively now with the Chinese in issues of nuclear terrorism. And that's what this example, I was there last August uh, in what we call the Young Professional Nuclear Forum. Uh, and we did a tabletop exercise with the young now, not with the experienced ones, on how do you deal with radiological terrorism. Uh, and it was just, it was fantastic. It was absolutely fantastic. These young folks work together like you cannot believe. So we do nuclear terrorism issues together, non-proliferation issues. I have, I've had many discussions with the Chinese about North Korea. In 2004, they thought the North Koreans literally couldn't tie their own shoes. They don't think that way anymore today. Uh, we're pretty much on the same wavelength uh, today. Uh, and we talk about non-proliferation broader. Uh, we've pretty much cut off the weapons sort of labs discussions about our arsenals and so forth. Uh, and for the most part, the Chinese at least still stick to having a small arsenal, although they're certainly modernizing it. But generally, the story of the Chinese interactions with us is a very positive uh, story. And the same has gone for the Department of Energy. I should have said all of those uh, programs that we ran through lab to lab was all through the uh, Department of Energy with the money coming from the Department of Energy. Uh, when I had discussions uh, early on uh, today with a, a couple of colleagues here, uh, I was asked, well, what about uh, India and Pakistan? You know, how come we're not worried about them? Well, it turns out I am worried about India and Pakistan. They've been in India six times. Uh, you know, India have these grandiose plans uh, about the future of nuclear power. Uh, they also happen to have weapons, and they've been modernizing those. But really, their heart is in nuclear power. And Homi Baba laid out a plan for them as to how you go from the normal reactors to plutonium breeder reactors to thorium breeder reactors. And by God, they were moving along that direction. And some of those, like here's a picture of myself uh, in front of the, uh, the big 500 megawatt electric uh, breeder reactor that was going up in Kalpakam uh, at IGCAR, Indira Gandhi uh, Center for Atomic uh, Research. Uh, and it turns out those paths that they've chosen to this grandiose future has all kinds of proliferation challenges. Uh, I'm not necessarily against those, but you have to understand the challenges and you have to make sure that you're ready. Besides, their own complex also, in my opinion, uh, just wasn't quite up to the issue of nuclear security and safeguards. Uh, and so we tried to work with the Indians. Uh, the deal, you know, that was first struck in 2005 and then signed 2008 has actually brought US uh, and uh, India uh, nuclear security experts somewhat closer together. So we have actually made, I think, some progress uh, with the Indians. In Pakistan, uh, where lots of people will say, look, this may be one of the more dangerous places in the world, certainly from a standpoint of, of nuclear weapons, it's a dangerous place. Uh, and, and that is that it's sort of 
they were always paranoid about the Indians. They always had this inferiority complex vis-a-vis -vis the Indians. And then once that deal was signed, it may have been great for the Indians, but then just made the Pakistan situation that much worse. And so that's been really, really difficult. In addition, you know, they have the issues of nuclear security and safety uh, and safeguards in a, very, in a very challenging environment. And so I've been over to Pakistan. Actually, I gave a lecture uh, at Qaid e Azam uh, University in Islamabad to about 200 students. Uh, it was just, it was fantastic. Great, great questions. Uh, and here I am at National Defense University. Uh, and I would say bottom line so far uh, is their nuclear security is much better than what I had expected. But it's not good enough because they live in such a challenging environment. Uh, just a word, we discussed the Iran this afternoon, uh, I'll just say very, very briefly. Uh, in 2008, Bill Perry and I uh, were there in Iran, and this is uh, Mr. Samare, uh, who was Ahmadinejad's security advisor. And, and if you look closely, you see my fingers, uh, and that is he was trying to tell me that the difference between nuclear power and nuclear weapons is a huge gap. And I would say, no, 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 it's like this. <laughs> Uh, and then what they did over the next uh, you know, five years was make it closer. And then that's essentially where we were uh, when the deal uh, was uh, struck. I don't see Scott Kemp here tonight, but uh, Scott was with me uh, when we met with the Iranians before that first deal was struck. This was September uh, of 2013. And we met with uh, Minister Tsarif. Uh, we met with his technical people. Uh, Oli Hanunen uh, also was there had a fascinating discussions with the Iranians. The first time that I had hoped that uh, we could actually make some progress with the Iranian, they may be serious about this. And, and so we had a very good discussion. Uh, Scott stayed involved. He was very, very good advisor to the US government. Uh, but then we had a really good scientist who happens to be from this institution who was in the right position, Ernie Moniz, with his counterpart, Salehi. Uh, and so this negotiation was better supported by technical expertise than almost any negotiation I can see anywhere. And the result of it is technically, on the nuclear issues, you just couldn't have done any better, way better than what I expected after my September discussions. Now that doesn't mean that Iran you know, is gonna be an easy case because there's everything else, you know, from what's happening in Syria, in Iraq, uh, you know, Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthis, the missile program isn't part of that, as was discussed. But on the nuclear front, it's as good as one can get. OK, so to wrap it up then, to just have a few sort of commonalities uh, of scientific diplomacy. Uh, we do have a common cause. Uh, we have a common language, uh, professional respect that we have for each other. For example, when I talk plutonium metallurgy with my North Korean counterpart, he just he immediately, he was good, you have respect. That often then leads to trust, and the trust uh, really helps. And then as we know, in the political business, sometimes one doesn't have good vibes, one doesn't have good trust. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I thought this was not the best photo I've ever seen uh, of showing that on the political front, you know, one could have differences uh, of views. Now, you're going to see this is very different than this. The person on the right is my colleague from Los Alamos. I took the picture. The person on the left uh, is the Soviet and then Russian scientist who did those experiments with plutonium explosive uh, and explosives uh, under the ground. And he wanted to have, uh, we wanted to take him to dinner. He said, now, why don't we just get a little salami and some chleb, you know, some bread and some piva, some beer, and we'll just do it in the room. So, this sort of relationship uh, is what lets us work together. The other thing is, you know, initially when the U.S. saw those four loose dangers, in the U.S. government, everything it saw when it looked at the Soviet and then Russia was bad. It was dangerous. Elimination cut back. Well, you can imagine, I mean, they had all these hundreds of thousands of people Guess what? They didn't just want to eliminate what they had. Their weapons were going to guarantee their sovereignty. Their nuclear materials were for their children, because plutonium you can burn in reactors, they said. 
the nuclear people. They were going to be the experts to revitalize the Soviet economy. And the export nuclear power was going to be their high-tech export. So they saw that as sort of uh, you know, the legacy, the gift from heaven. They wanted to do good, not just to prevent bad. So the way we did that, and much of the book actually talks about the scientific collaboration. This is an experiment inside the fence, so to speak, in the Russian Los Alamos. And, and you can't even tell which ones are Russians, which ones are Americans. They're working together on this experiment. It turns out it goes back to the Sakharov days, using explosives. As I said, they like to blow things up. In this case, using explosives to squeeze a magnetic field, to make super high magnetic fields. They were better at that than anybody. We were pretty good, but they were actually better. And so one of those experiments uh, created, uh, at that time, the largest magnetic field ever created. Uh, 28 megagauss. Just to give you an idea of megagauss, there is a magnetic field sort of 2 tenths to 6 tenths of a gauss. So this is 50 million times the Earth's magnetic field. After that, take a look at this. Okay. They can look closely at the, this is Sasha Bikov, the Russian, picking up Steve Younger, who uh, in a week or so is going to be the new director at Sandia. He was at Los Alamos working with me. It's that sort of relationship. That's what builds the bonds. And it was the scientific bonds that then allowed us to talk about nuclear weapons safety, about nuclear materials security. That's what it takes. Sharing a sense uh, of global responsibility. Again, you read the, uh, some of the stories in the book. I mean, they had a sense of global responsibility. Of course, patriotism for their country, but also a sense of global responsibility. And then the human dimension, and we try to play that up in the book. That's what I just said. You just saw one of uh, a couple of those examples. Here's an interesting one. Uh, so the guy in the middle, and look at those cool slippers. Uh, so he is the former chairman of the Indian Atomic Energy Commission. Uh, M.R. Srinivasan. We were together there, actually, in, a, in his hotel room, Heim Brown from Stanford and myself. It's a sort of relationship that you wind up having with these people. And then finally, on the human dimension, what I think is always important, we go to these countries, uh, and we in the United States tend to demonize the leadership of other countries. And along with that, we have a tendency to demonize the people. You know, like today, I mean, most people look at North Korea and they just see nothing but bad and nothing but demons. Well, I've been over there. I mean, I've visited lots of places. What I see is this. You know, look at that young lady in front and the two in the back. They are so cute. It's not their fault they have that regime. We shouldn't demonize the people. I went to schools, boys doing physics experiments. Oops, went the wrong direction. Uh, this young lady was writing an essay on Thomas Alpha Edison. Like, it's a North Korean school. It's just a lot of places aren't what we think it is. And then Pakistan. My wife did not want me to go to Pakistan. Uh, but she's put up with 52 trips to Russia. I'm going 53rd next week, 30-some to China. This one she was really concerned about. So I took these photos and I sent it home to her. And I said, if they got Elvis Presley in the coffee shop, this place can't be so bad. <laughs> OK, so those are some of the commonalities. And I'm the guy who likes to talk about that, because I think it's so essential. And the scientific diplomacy and the interactions, they're most effective if they're actually done to help inform government, and if you can do it hand to hand. That's very difficult to do at times, because quite frankly, a lot of folks in State Department, they view us as boy or girl scientists trying to be diplomats. Uh, and, and so trying to develop the relationships, even within your own government, are as important as they are with trying to uh, develop the relationships. And of course, there are risks. Uh, you know, the risks are, you're going to get these scientists over there babbling with the Russians. You know, what about all the secrets? Well, you have risks. There's no question. But I think overall, the benefits outweigh the risks. So I'm going to stop there. I've gone on longer than I had planned, but I got carried away. So I'll, I'll leave it at that, Jim, and turn it back to you. Thank you.
take some questions and answers. Do you want oh, to oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I can, I'm staying here tonight, so. <laughs> so any, any questions? Yes, indeed. So I, I have difficulty uh, hearing, so I may have to come closer, but go ahead. Thank you so much for this fantastic lecture. Um, so, um, so recently, you know, listening to policy discussions about North Korean you know, program, we hear a lot about China, 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 because China accounts for the 75% of North Korean exports. And so, you know, people are assuming that China is the only one that can really put pressure, economic pressure on North Korea. But to me, I, I tend to think that uh, focusing too much on China is a little misleading or doesn't help, probably because China doesn't want to put real pressure on North Korea out of fear that the, the DPRK regime might collapse, but also probably because uh, I think that it's now a little too late to reverse the course to really demilitarize the North uh, Korean Peninsula. And so I think that a real important question to ask is what are those countries that account for the remaining 25% of the North Korean trade? And those are essentially African and Middle East countries because those countries have very lax uh, export control regulations. And so UN economic sanctions are not really implementing effectively in those countries. And indeed, uh, actually, the, uh, the, the trade volume between North Korea and African countries more than doubled over the last eight years compared to the previous eight years. And so I guess my question is, uh, so having talked to those North Korean leaders, how, uh, how are you evaluating the North Korean intention to further proliferate from North Korea to those developing countries? And you know, do you think that North Korean nuclear engineers could be the 21st century if you can? And if you think that that's a possibility, then what are things that we could do to prevent further proliferation from North Korea to the, the rest of the world? Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, thank you very much for both uh, your comment uh, and your question. I, I agree with you that uh, China is, is not the solution by itself. Uh, there just isn't any way. Uh, we have very different objectives. Uh, the, the Chinese don't want the North Koreans to have nuclear weapons, but the way that I can interpret it, they will not bring the North Korean regime to its knees to force that. Uh, so they would have liked to slow the North Korean program down, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, do they even have the means in terms of the rest of the trade that's there by North Korea? I, I think the, the, the Chinese could still pretty much uh, do enormous economic damage to North Korea. Will that stop the nuclear weapons work? Probably not, is my, is my view. Uh, in terms uh, of the export, um, so we, we have, as, as you likely know, uh, there are examples of, of North Korea having exported. Uh, so the North Koreans exported uh, uranium hexafluoride, uh, the feed material uh, for centrifuges to Libya. And that's quite clear that they did so. Uh, and, and in my opinion, it was meant to be uh, repeat business. Uh, so that was the first batch that they sent. And then if the Libyans would have been able to get the centrifuges going, and they never got close, then they would have sold them you know, the uranium hexafluoride on an ongoing basis. That's what they were looking for. They then they built uh, the uh, plutonium-producing reactor uh, in Syria. Uh, and it's also quite clear that the North Koreans did that. It's also quite clear that that reactor was meant for plutonium production. Uh, North Koreans did that. They started that maybe in the late 1990s. Uh, Israelis bombed it, or the deal at least was made. Israelis bombed this in 2007. Uh, so one can't say that the North Koreans would never do that. Uh, so am I worried about them exporting now? Uh, in most likely likelihood, uh, I think they understand that that's not, uh, that's not good for them, both from a Chinese and from an American standpoint. However, 
uh, as you might have seen in news over the last couple of months, uh, they had an advertisement for lithium deuteride uh, that they wanted to sell. Lithium deuteride is sort of a neat way of being able to make tritium in a bomb, uh, because if you pick up uh, uh, neutrons in lithium-6 deuteride, uh, you can make tritium on the spot. And it looks like they actually had an advertisement to, to do so. So one, one can't say that they wouldn't under any circumstance. Am I worried about them actually selling plutonium? No, because they don't have enough of it. Am I worried about them selling highly enriched uranium? I also don't think so. Uh, am I worried about them perhaps selling some of the technologies and capabilities? Yes. Uh, I think that's a distinct possibility. And, and the more desperate they become, uh, uh, the more uh, they will try to squeeze out uh, in that direction. Just to finish the China story, as I mentioned, I've been comparing notes with the Chinese a lot on North Korea. Uh, and it was about six, seven years ago uh, that I tried to convince our government uh, in a somewhat different direction during the Obama administration than what they were taking. Uh, and, and what I, I had put together was what I called three no's. Uh, three no's for three yeses. And at that time, it was going to be negotiations. Uh, and the three no's were no more bombs, which meant no highly enriched uranium platoon, no better bombs, which meant no testing or long range missile tests, and no export. The Chinese loved that. So that the Chinese, both my colleagues and the government, could buy that because it's not a way to try to bring them to their knees, it's a way to what I uh, sort of called it then was halt, roll back, and then eventually eliminate the nuclear weapons. That's still where the Chinese want to go today. But probably the best example of what the Chinese really think and why they think so differently than we do, in the Global Times, one of the uh, Chinese English language newspapers, I think it was the day before the Trump-Xi summit, uh, they wrote a piece, uh, an editorial, uh, about what's going to happen there. A and they just said it straight out. They said, look, you Americans, you made the mess in North Korea. You are the ones that caused the security anxiety of the North Koreans. And until you fix that, there can't be a solution to the problem. So go and set up a communications link with the North Koreans. That's sort of the bottom line. They don't speak formally for the government, but that's pretty much what I see as the government view. Next question. I'll try to make the subsequent answers shorter. Yes? So it's me again, I'm sorry, but I have two questions. One, you talked about how the weak export control regime that enables North Korea to build up some of its programs, so I wanted to know if you think that the gaps in that export regime have been filled to a certain degree, or if not. And then, um, you know, India was the country whose nuclear tests inspired a lot of the current export control regime, and so now it's clamoring to join the nuclear suppliers group, and I just wanted to know whether you thought that was a good bad idea. I'm sorry, the last part, could you? Uh, what you think of India's bid to join nuclear suppliers? Oh, yeah. So, so the, the, the question was the export regime, which I mentioned as part of the problem. Uh, so has that problem been fixed? And, and so it's been uh, cut down quite a bit. Uh, but still, uh, there are holes and gaps uh, in that export control. Uh, so somehow, you know, with businesses being greedy, second and third parties. I think right now, uh, I, I think the, the North Koreans, to make plutonium, they don't need anything from anybody else. For the highly enriched uranium, they still may need some material, some exports perhaps, although I think they can make some of the key materials themselves. However, what's probably happening today, that a lot of the things that they need, they're getting from China, not formally from the government, but coming across the Yalu River or just outside uh, you know, in, the, uh, in the West Sea. And so that has not been shut down completely and will continue to contribute to those countries that are absolutely adamant in going ahead. Uh, the India and, um, uh, and whether they should be allowed to join the NSG, uh, since I've started to work a lot with the Pakistanis and, and the main work that I do with the Pakistanis, well, one is the issue of strategic stability vis-a-vis -vis India. 
Uh, and, and I'm afraid that one is just really hard to solve. And, and I don't know how much, if anything, I can contribute there. If we get the Indians and Pakistanis to talk more about that, the US government to do that would help. But where I can contribute is in the issue of nuclear material safeguard security and things of that nature. And, and that's what we're, what we're working. But what I've learned by uh, working with the Pakistanis, if I've only been there once, but I've had six different workshops. Uh, is that India deal really set the Pakistanis back. And then the last thing they say, for heaven's sakes, they cannot join the nuclear suppliers group. Uh, so at this point, because I worry about India and Pakistan, uh, is unless they both join the nuclear suppliers group, I don't think it's a good idea. Yes? One of the themes that comes through in your presentation of the history of dealing with these problem states is the, the application of broader and longer term thinking. Uh, could, you, <clears throat> could you give us a brief assessment of whether that thinking is going on now in our system, and if so, where? Yeah, so, so the question is, you know, is there a broader and longer term system going on right, right now? I, I, I think that's been declining for some time. Uh, and, and particularly the, the scientific connections that I've talked about ha have become more difficult. Uh, uh, with Russia uh, almost totally uh, terminated uh, because of Crimea and, and Eastern Ukraine and the US reactions to that. Uh, and actually the Trump election sort of rekindled enough of a hope that I'm actually going over there <laughs> next week which I don't think I would have otherwise. But of course, the, you know, that Trump window is also closing again real quickly. So we'll see whether I actually get in there on Saturday night uh, or not. Uh, but the role that the scientists played, and actually we, we played a big role in this, and the, the role that the non-governmental community played, the people that I showed you, they were just some of them, uh, it's really hard to know where that is today. Just much, much less so. I, I was director at Los Alamos, and, and I put an enormous amount of effort into this because I thought my job at Los Alamos is to make sure we don't have a nuclear war on the world. I have a nuclear disaster. And in 1991-92, that Soviet coming apart was the biggest thing that I saw. Uh, and then a lot of our scientists, also Livermore, uh, Sandia, and then the other DOE laboratories, you know, from Argonne uh, uh, to Oak Ridge to others, they were excited about doing this. I and mean, there was an excitement. That excitement seems to have gone. And so that sort of excitement, the scientists coming in, is much less so today than it was then. Are others thinking, the academic community is, is still thinking quite uh, you know, far out in that direction. But I see it more and more uncoupled from, from the government. And with the current administration, quite frankly, we, I just don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, I had great connections into the Obama administration, I had very good connections into Bush and Clinton and so forth. Uh, in the current one, I just, I just don't know. Uh, and so we'll have to wait and see how that plays out. What you'd want to make sure is they pay attention when, when you get uh, an Ash Carter, Steve Miller <laughs> report on Soviet nuclear fission, or maybe the next one, you know, Pakistan, India, that somebody actually pays attention. They did back then. President Bush himself, I didn't mention it in my longer talk, I give him credit, George H.W. Bush. The presidential nuclear initiatives were really quite remarkable. He called Gorbachev on September 27, 1991, and said, hey, Mikhail, here's what I'm going to do. And I'd appreciate if you take similar action. He said he was going to take the, the nuclear weapons off the surface ships and, and, and other things. So, a lot of that was sort of longer time thinking was in the rest of the community that had a way to link into the government. I'm worried about that link right now. So we are fast approaching the end of the evening, I think. Can we take maybe one more question? Yes, sir. Or, to, uh, or one or two. <laughs> There's insistence. I'm flexible. Yesterday we had a, some discussion on New START and nuclear weapon modernization. I was wondering what your thoughts of that was, and you know, you mentioned brain drain. What's the state of our nuclear complex to uh, accomplish that? Okay, so those are two questions, right? New, <laughs> new start. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so on 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 the new start, uh, uh, we had some uh, discussion uh, earlier. 
Uh, I, I think the potential of an extension of New Start is not dead uh, in the water. I think the Russians could actually come around and Putin could come around himself and say just to extend that may do him enough good. That doesn't mean that he's not going to be modernizing. So actually this, this book also has a, it, it has this incredible article in there by the guy who was my counterpart and it's called Nuclear Weapons of Russia Today. And he lays out what the discussion we had this afternoon. I was really uh, attempted to step in, but it, it wasn't uh, my turn. And he lays out this issue of tactical nuclear weapons and why. And the way that he explained it was really fascinating this article. So, so he so I said, strategic weapons are for global deterrence. Tactical weapons are for regional deterrence. Regional deterrence. So it's not just so much as to whether they're going to use them you know, but having those tactical nuclear weapons, they feel is going to give them more operating room in their near abroad. So to them, that's really important. Their modernization, uh, and it's, it's actually, it's, it's painful for me to see this. So in 1992, they were bankrupt. And we were sitting on top of the world, you know, presumably having won the Cold War, although as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, I don't think we particularly won it, but it ended. Uh, so they, we were sitting on top of the world. They were bankrupt. Today, the nuclear complexes have switched. They're in better shape than we are. They're in better shape than we are. Uh, and that is, they have a modernization program. Uh, they're two labs. You know, they have a Los Alamos and a Livermore. Our Los Alamos and Livermore used to compete against each other. Okay, we don't compete anymore because there are no new systems. We do what's called peer review. <coughs> Well, peer review is okay, but it's not like competing. They still compete. They have new systems. Because they say, you know, tactical nuclear weapons for regional deterrence. By the way, if we have tactical nuclear weapons, guess what? We need new ones. Because in case they're used on our own soil, they have to be smaller yield and cleaner. We don't want to contaminate our own, in our own country. So they're developing new, well, you know, new tactical weapons. Their complexes have you know, received an enormous upgrade. And they needed it because they really, you know, it degraded substantially in the 1990s. On the other hand, the American complex is unprepared. And, and it's really, really a pity. And so you hear all this flack we catch in the US about modernization of the US nuclear arsenal of all these, the $1 trillion that's going to be spent. The focus is on the wrong place. It shouldn't be on the money. Focus is, are these places able to do their job? Are the production factories actually able to continue to manufacture our weapons? Are the nuclear weapons labs still have the confidence and the competence to provide the whole spectrum of everything that you need? And the answer is, we're slipping. Uh, and so that's a great, great concern. So modernization in the US complex is sorely needed but not in terms of injection of new weapons, of lots of new one, money, but some of that has to be done on the military side. But it's mostly we have to turn around uh, what's happened to decay the morale and the capabilities uh, in the Department of Energy and an NSA complex. Absent a burning, insistent question. I survey the room and I don't see it. So we have had a good day, a long day, but a good day, and we saved the best for last. So I hope you'll join me in thanking our esteemed guests. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.